Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Charlton. I'm a director and co-founder of Alpha Beta. Uh, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session entitled Innovation and Collaboration, What Matters and What Can Be Done. We have three excellent panellists to discuss this topic. Uh, Ava Lenanen, who is a global expert on innovation and education, and also the Vice-Chancellor of Murdoch University. Sue McClemon, who is the CEO of MTP Connect, where she sits at the intersection of government and industry driving competitiveness in one of our most innovative sectors, and Larry Marshall, who is the CEO of the CSIRO, surely one of the jewels in the crown of Australia's innovation system. Uh, before we get to their perspectives and your questions, uh, I've been asked to present a couple of um, background slides to contextualise this topic. And being a consultant, producing slides is within my competency set. So, <laughs> Here we go. Uh, this is some work that I'm going to present which uh, draw upon, uh, draws upon a project we did with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre, which is one of the government's uh, growth centres to drive competitiveness, uh, in their case, in the manufacturing industry in Australia. And the question was, what really drives competitiveness in Australian manufacturing and Australian industries more broadly? And when you ask this question uh, in Australia, in my experience, uh, when you ask companies what governments can do to help them, you get a standard shopping list of answers. Business people will talk to you about tax, they'll talk to you about tax concessions, they'll talk to you about regulation, they'll talk to you about uh, labour markets, they'll talk to you about trade and export markets. We wanted to get behind that shopping list, and so we asked the question in the other way. What makes you successful on the global stage? What is it about you, an Australian successful exporter, that makes you competitive on the world stage? And what specifically did government do to help you get there? And so we asked a question of international purchasing managers. We called up purchasing managers in uh, the United States, in Europe, in Asia, around the world, and we said, when you buy from Australia, when you buy manufactured goods from Australia, when you pick up the phone and dial 6-1 in order to buy an input into your process, why do you do that? No doubt you could get it more cheaply from a lower cost country. No doubt you could get it uh, from somewhere closer to your production facility. So when you buy from Australia, why do you buy from Australia? And the answers were really fascinating. Um, there were lots of things that mattered. Things like reliability, product quality, flexibility and service, they mattered. But these purchasing managers said they're a given. We just expect that. That's not what makes us buy from you. Overwhelmingly, when purchasing managers bought from Australia, they said the reason they did so was not because we were the cheapest. In fact, in many cases, they said we weren't the cheapest. They were buying products from Australia rather than from low-cost Asia or around the corner in the United States or Europe because the Australian product was better, because it had features that made it distinctive, because it had performance that was stronger than the other products that were available to them. That was the essence of why they purchased from Australia. And yet, when you look at um, some of the new wonderful um, BCS data that um, has been curated in, by the ABS and the Department of Industry, we see a very different focus of Australian industries. Um, this is some BCS data which asks, asks firms a very simple question. What is your focus? Is it cost or innovation? And the answer from Australian manufacturers was cost much more than innovation and increasingly cost and decreasingly innovation. When uh, that same BCS survey asked Australian firms uh, what the components of their innovation agenda were. Do you collaborate on R&D? Are you undertaking ongoing development of goods and services? Are you breaking into new markets? Are you investing more in IT? Are you introducing new methods or products? The answers were very, very 
week. There's a lot of room for improvement in Australia to shift the focus from thinking about costs, not that costs aren't important, but to focus on what really drives Australian competitiveness in the eyes of our customers, which is innovation and technological superiority. And that doesn't just work for our exports, it matters for a profitability. When you ask those questions and correlate those, which you can now do using this wonderful Blade data, by the way, a bit of a plug for the ABS. Uh, when you correlate innovation with firm performance, uh, you see that the most innovative firms are the most profitable. The firms that answered most of these questions, yes, they have increased the quality of their skills, they have collaborated for R&D, they have increased their expenditure on IT. The firms that answer most of those questions, yes, are the firms that are the most profitable. So that was, that was question number one uh, in, in this piece of work. And question number two was great. Well, if innovation matters, if product superiority, superiority matters, if technological uh, superiority is what makes Australian firms competitive on a global stage, then what can you do as government to focus on that? And again, we wanted to ask the question a little differently. So rather than saying, how can government help you, we did a survey of successful Australian firms and asked them to think back. The product today which they're selling successfully on the world stage, when did they develop that product? And at that time, what was their interaction with various parts of the innovation ecosystem? What was it back in that time that helped them get their breakthrough? Was it, uh, was it a fundamental research grant? Was it the, were they getting the R&D tax incentive? Did that matter? Was it targeted specific R&D uh, support from the government? Was it a collaboration with university? Was it their engagement in a cluster of, of like-minded um, entrepreneurial or innovative businesses? Was it coordination uh, between, uh, by an industry body? What, did they spin out of a bigger firm? Uh, did they get some big government contract that helped them along the way? Um, did they have a uh, a big piece of foreign investment or VC funding. What was it? What were the ingredients that went into the Petri dish at the time that they developed their distinctive product superiority that made them successful on the world stage? And the answers were really interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't one thing. It was a range of things, a real mix of different factors. 22% uh, you know, of firms said that at the time they developed their technological breakthrough, they received a fundamental research grant from the government. 26% said that they thought that the R&D tax incentive was important in the development of the product or technology or innovation that helped them become successful on the world stage. Um, uh, industry collaboration was important. Venture capital was important. Um, what I think we thought was really interesting, though, was to break those answers down into some subcategories. Um, because obviously not all firms are the same, not all innovation processes are the same. Uh, and what matters in terms of sparking innovation uh, across different industries and products could be different. So in, in this work, we broke down the survey into two industries, medical technologies and aerospace. And you can see a real difference in what these successful firms said was important to them in sparking their success at the time that they developed their technological breakthrough. For medical technologies, it was much more about the public research support, government support for commercial R&D. For aerospace, it was more around procurement, collaboration, uh, and financing. Different industries feeling that different parts of the innovation system were more important for them. And you know, that, that makes sense from the perspective that you know, different innovation models apply to different industries and are stimulated by different things. You know, in medical technology, for example, in a range of industries with some similar characteristics, that fundamental research, that breakthrough, that development of that new product uh, often comes from 
collaboration with the university, from fundamental research, from VC or R&D subsidies. That is the, uh, that's the kindling at the bottom of the fire for those uh, technological breakthroughs. Whereas for um, aerospace, for example, which is more about the integration of complex systems uh, and bringing together many different uh, uh, parts into a whole, there the presence of things to support scale economies, government demand, a procurement contract, uh, a collaboration across industries, uh, across firms within an industry, that was more important. So what matters uh, for, um, for competitiveness? Innovation matters, as you would all know. Uh, and how do we develop innovation? Well, I think there's some specific evidence around what sparks innovation and what matters. And these, are, these and other issues are what we are going to uh, explore in this session. So for the next uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to ask some questions of our distinguished panelists uh, and then open it up to the floor. Uh, we're going to structure this around, um, firstly, trying to describe the, the problem, if there is one. What is the state of Australian innovation and collaboration. How are we doing? Secondly, what's the cause of that situation? Are we, what are the underlying factors that are leading us to be where we are? And then thirdly, um, what can we do about it? And I've had the benefit of uh, very stimulating conversations with all of our panelists prior to today. So I can assure you that this is um, going to be an interesting discussion with some uh, fascinating perspectives. So uh, let, me, let me begin with this problem question. And I'll start with Ava. Um, Ava, could you tell us, from your perspective and experience, where are we at in Australia on innovation and collaboration? Do we have a problem? Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, I've had the pleasure of listening to quite a, a lot of sessions this morning, and I think we have had the opportunity to define some of the challenges that they are. Um, I have worked in the university sector for 30 years. Um, in Europe, um, UK, Finland is my home country, and also here in Australia. And I like to talk about a challenge which is a little bit different from, I think, what we've heard about so far. It has been sort of mentioned in passing, and this is around cultural frameworks within which innovation is situated. So. I was reading the um, speech that the chief scientist made in Berlin, um, I think about a month ago. And uh, this was, um, he was talking about um, how Germany had become this uh, engine for innovation. And uh, he used a particular phrase, which he thought was really descriptive of what uh, made German uh, such an innovation hub. And this was that if you rest, you rust. I can't say in German, but uh, there is the, the intent there that there's some kind of a work ethic there and there's some kind of a, a driver behind the innovation culture. I was also thinking about Israel, and I went to, uh, as you know, Israel is hailed as one of those uh, great nations of innovation, and I went to uh, a breakfast the other morning, which was the Australia-Israel uh, Chamber of Commerce. And they show this video, some of you may have seen it, which is about um, the Israeli culture. And there was something about along the lines that the Israeli people don't take no for an answer. And they really push and push and, and keep going with, for a particular goal. And then I was talking to some and looking at some American culture. And uh, there was an interesting piece there, which was around uh, risk taking. And today in one of the panels, I think it was Alex Zelensky, who spoke about the fact that he has this wonderful funding for uh, innovation in defense. And I thought it was very good of him to say, some of that funding, some of the projects will not succeed. And I think that is a really important message that we need to think about. And, and then my, my little country, Finland, where I come from, 5.2 million people. And uh, it is uh, hailed as a, a, a country for uh, doing well in all sorts of metrics on innovation. And I've been thinking about it, and I'd like to introduce to you to one small word. And that word is SISU, S-I-S-U. And there's a Finnish researcher who said what that means. It means that SISU begins where perseverance ends. And there's also a feeling of that innovation is not an individual activity, 
It's a collective activity. So um, I think I would ask you, you know, how does that resonate with the innovation culture and innovation challenges that we have in Australia? Uh, and how would we then start to align our policies, our uh, incentives, uh, how would we uh, align our initiatives to the cultural framework that we believe is the one with, that, will, that will take us the next step? Um, so that is something that I uh, think we haven't talked a lot about uh, at this conference, but looking slightly from the outside in, I mean, I have been in Australia for nearly five years, so more inside than out. But looking outside in, I think that would be one of those fundamental things might, we might like, might like to think about. Another point I'd just like to make before I pass over to the next speaker is um, collaboration. And I was really pleased to see, Andrew, in your data that universities, particularly in certain sectors, were adding real value uh, to the innovation of, in business and industry. And I wanted to talk a little bit about international collaboration. And I think that's, again, going to be a game changer. And I was look, thinking about the NISA funding. And I think there is $35 million for international collaboration in that funding. I think in the UK, uh, the, there's recently been announced around $3 billion for international collaboration. So. Um, if we were to think about international collaboration as one big driver for the next steps and being a, a challenge for Australia, being somewhat isolated, um, I would think that funding that would go into that. And this morning I had an opportunity to speak with uh, Minister Sinodinas, and I said if I had a magic wand, I would probably uh, shift some of the tax incentives to business and industry to the International Collaboration Fund. I think I'll stop there. Right, thank thank you. you. So you, you have an interesting perspective on the challenge. Um, you said that you think uh, Australia has more strengths than we sometimes know. Is that better? That's better. <laughs> so you said you think that Australia has more, more strengths than sometimes we give ourselves credit for. Could you give us a sense of, of how you think we're performing on collaboration and innovation? Yeah, thanks for that. And it was uh, interesting that you brought up um, uh, our chief scientist's presentation in Germany because I was actually in the room when he gave that. And uh, as we toured around um, and looked at global best practice in Germany, uh, in Switzerland and in France, and also I got the opportunity to spend some time in the UK, I kept thinking that, in fact, there's a whole lot that we're doing here in Australia uh, that are actually really good bones and quite a lot of achievement to date that we could build on, but we're just not very good at communicating some of that success. And if you actually look uh, at the constraints and barriers for our sector, and they include things like investment and focus and alignment, uh, skills, uh, access to the global value chain, uh, collaboration uh, between business uh, and academia research, uh, regulatory frameworks, which is critically important in, in my area, given the long-term uh, development timelines required for medtech, biotech and pharma, and then ultimately policy. Look, there are lots of constraints there, but there's actually quite a lot being done in each of those areas. And uh, we actually have quite a lot of money going into our sector, and we've had some additional money announced in the budget. Uh, we have the MRFF now starting to flow. We have the first investments from the Biomedical Translation Fund, uh, and we have some terrific incentives in the advanced manufacturing area. And I actually think uh, it's not about uh, more money. I think it's about better alignment of money uh, and celebrating uh, some of the things that we're already doing. And I don't think we give ourselves enough credit. This is a globally competitive market, but Australia punches above its weight when it comes to world-class infrastructure and early commercialisation. What we need to look at is how we're investing in knowledge transfer, and I think that came out very clearly in the Office of Innovation Science Australia report, where I think there's a great acknowledgement for the work that our um, research uh, organisations, including CSIRO and our university sector and MRIs, are doing, but that we need to invest more of that money in a more targeted way um, to actually ensure that we don't just get that knowledge development, but we also get that knowledge transfer and ultimately that commercialisation. So I think there are 
of course, things that we need to do. In our sector, we actually punch above our weight in terms of collaboration, um, and you will know that it's very difficult to take a product in the mid-tech, pharma or biotech sector to market by yourself. And a classic example of that is I sit on a board called Adventus Medical, uh, and it's in the 3D advanced manufacturing space and the sleep apnea space, and it took 27 collaborations to get that product to market in the US and Australia. The one that everyone knows um, is the is the work that we did with CSIRO at Lab 2021 20, with, with their um, 3D printing capability, and that was really important. But no one person can take a product to market in our sector by themselves, and so you absolutely need that collaboration. We can do better there, but we're actually doing um, pretty well already. Uh, we just don't celebrate that success. Thanks, Sue. Larry, um, Sue's area is probably one of the shining successes that Australia has in uh, commercialisation of, of innovation and technology. How do you see it across the board from your perspective at CSIRO? You mean Australia's capability and in innovation? Yeah, where are we at? Um, gee. <laughs> well, if you look at the statistics, we're um, in the back of the pack. Um, and it's true, we're better than we think we are in, in many areas. Um, but. The fundamental problem is we don't capture the value of the innovations that we create. We, we're not good at creating value from them. Um, there are easily a hundred world-changing great Australian inventions. Um, who's wearing cotton? Anyone wearing cotton? Everyone? Everyone wearing cotton? Okay. So this is Australian cotton, right? It does not grow in Australia. Cotton will not grow in Australia, so it had to be reinvented using science. So the only reason if you're wearing Australian cotton, it's because Australian science and not just CSIRO, although we did a lot, but in collaboration with the universities, reinvented the commodity and made it unique. So today, the top 20% of the world's cotton is Australian cotton, reinvented by science. Now, that's a wonderful example of something that we did a long time ago, five decades ago, to reinvent a commodity into something high value and to capture the value domestically. So can we do it? Yes, we absolutely can. Um, here's another example. Talk about medical devices. This is the titanium heel that saved a man's leg in Melbourne. There's also a titanium sternum, or two or three of them now, that have saved lives in Europe. What's great about this, it's a connection between the digital world and the physical world. So you can imagine anything, imagine it, draw it on a computer, and produce it using 3D printing. But what's really amazing about this, and the same technology um, as one of the enabling technologies in Oventus, is it takes a commodity, titanium mineral sands, worth nothing, pennies per pound, and instead of digging it up and shipping it off overseas and selling it for pennies per pound, we turn it into something unique, titanium ink, worth hundreds of dollars per pound. But we didn't stop there. In collaboration with medical SMEs and numerous universities, we created unique medical products um, with a company called Anatomics in particular that actually have a priceless value when they, when they save a life. I think that's one of the opportunities for Australia is to take a commodity, something we're really good at, we're great at commodities, and turn it into something unique and recognise and capture the value of that unique attribute here in Australia. The other thing I'd say, um, and so you mentioned um, the market roadmap work. So uh, Australia's a great follower. In research, we invent amazing things, and we are a bit of a leader in research. We're seventh in the OECD. By all accounts, we probably should be tenth um, based on our GDP. So we're actually, to your point, better than we think we are. But in terms of markets, um, our marketing capability, not communications and branding, we're great at that, but our ability to understand markets, our ability to predict where markets are going is terrible. We really lack that ability. If you look at places like Silicon Valley, they're incredible at predicting where the market can go or actually making it go there, making it go places that you couldn't have imagined it to go. But they do that by mapping the future, by using various types of technology, including science, to basically predict scenarios that they think are likely to happen in the future, and they invest in them. I'll just give you one more example. So um, investors uh, tend to follow Silicon Valley. I don't know if you remember the internet bubble back in 2000, but it was preceded by the telecom bubble and then the software bubble and so on, and the internet bubble. Um, the investors that drove that bubble were, say, the top three investors in Silicon Valley, and they literally funded the core of the internet companies like Google. The rest of the pack, the other 90%, chased them and dumped in 10 times more money and created the tech wreck when the bubble burst. 
Ask yourself the question, what were the three lead investors in Silicon Valley doing when everyone else was shoveling money into the internet back in 1999? What were they doing? They were selling companies and they were reinvesting the profits into clean tech. And then they drove the clean tech bubble. That's the way it's been for 30, 40 years in Silicon Valley, because they're great at predicting where the market could go. So this road mapping work that we're doing, for example, with you, Sue, um, we're, we're trying to use science to help Australia do a better job of predicting the future. We reorganised our organisation, CSIRO, into 10 market verticals. You met one of the leaders earlier today, Adrian Turner. Isn't he great? Now, we have nine other great leaders like that. I hope you get to meet them as well. But they're trying to use science to do a better job of predicting the future so that we and the universities, because everything we do is collaborative with the universities. We don't do anything alone. Everything we do, the science that we create, is better aligned to where we think the market is going so we can lead the target. Why is that so important? Because when you're leading the target, it's no longer an argument about price. It's a race to capture the value. That's how companies in Silicon Valley are so successful. That's what we can do. Why do I believe that? Because we reinvented the cotton industry. We reinvented many other industries as well. We can do it. We have a 100-year history of doing it, but we've done it in traditional industries. The world is changing. We have to change with it. And why is that? So why, to Larry's point, why do you think Australia struggles to capture the value, why do we struggle sometimes to be ahead of the curve and commercialise um, some of these technologies that we have, the great researchers that are developing? Yes, so I think that we, we do have great infrastructure and we do have very good early researchers, as we have talked about, but I think that we have not had the level of sophistication in the investment markets um, or the risk profile uh, or, in fact, the skills and expertise across the board to, to take some of those ideas and really translate them and extract that value here in Australia. And I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why the Growth Centres uh, was, was put forward as an initiative really to drive that competitiveness and productivity in the sector and to address those constraints and barriers I spoke about before. Um, I think that we've got a really good basis for it though and I think if you can get some of those things aligned and you can invest in those things appropriately, you can actually drive a, a very, very positive future for Australia. We already punch above our weight in a whole lot of areas. For example in clinical trials, a lot of people don't know but Australia is incredibly competitive. We're number 10 globally, number 5 by per capita um, and we're doing trials in this country first in man anywhere in the world. So people are coming internationally to Australia to do some of that work here. Uh, and that's because we've invested in that sector. We've got the R&D tax incentive, which has been critically important. And we have the right regulatory frameworks with the TGA's clinical trial notification process, which means that we've got the fastest startup times anywhere in the world uh, in, a, in an environment where we actually have good ethics committees, uh, integrity of data, uh, and data that is uh, recognised all around the world in those major jurisdictions to take those products to market. So, I, look, I think that um, we have some challenges. I think that there's a lot of progress already, but we need to get better alignment on what we're investing in and the so sorts of skills that we're going to need for the future, because right now we've got a real skills gap coming in our sector and we're very worried about it. So, um, risk profile, capital markets, information, skills. Larry, I'm going to ask you another question in the hope that you have another prop to pull out of your bag. What, um, what can we do about these things? You mentioned one, you know, addressing some of the information gaps, providing a roadmap. What else can be done to address some of these challenges and improve innovation and collaboration? Um, well, I know collaboration's been a theme today, um, but, but I'm going to pick that one again because I think it's the most important, but I'll, I'll try and come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, so I mentioned um, the value capture. So, so we like, as a CEO, I like to measure things, um, metrics um, for business performance. Um, so we measure, um, using external consultants, the value of everything we do. I won't, I won't bore you with the mechanism by which we measure it, but in the last two years, we've done detailed case studies on 38 projects, and we've shown about $3 billion worth of value um, delivered by those 38 projects. Now, I don't want to extrapolate that to the whole of CSIRO, because we may have cherry-picked. Um, and they may have exaggerated, but what I was trying to figure out is do we deliver more value than the $749 million of government funding that goes in? And I'll sanity check that just for a second. So I think we do. Um, the reason I want to sanity check it, just to be sure, so we generate about 500 million of external revenue. So okay, 
that's pretty close to the appropriation. We also um, invest about 250 million in five of the seven landmark national infrastructure um, for science in Australia. Um, we do that in a way to give access to all universities, all researchers, um, free on a basis of merit. So that's a great investment in, in driving collaboration. So about, that leaves about half of, about 500 million of appropriate uh, against about 500 million of external revenue. So for me, it, there's a, is the taxpayer getting the value back for the appropriation they put in? I think, I think easily. But I'd highlight that $3 billion of value, we don't do anything alone. Um, everything we do is collaborative. 40% of what we do collaborates with more than three partners. So it's all about collaboration. We are the most connected part of the system, and that's why we're, our, our strategy currently is trying to drive to be an innovation catalyst, um, to help the system um, do a better job of capturing and retaining the value of what they create. What's the unique angle of collaboration I wanted to touch on today, because we've heard it all day. Um, so the answers to the questions you have to answer in innovation, innovation is about navigating ambiguity. It's about doing things that have never been done before. It's about not being afraid to fail. It's about not being afraid to do, what the press call it? A backflip. Oh my God, we tried something and changed direction and changed again and changed again and we got to success. Guess what? Every startup does that. Um, we have to get comfortable with that kind of agility, that kind of pivoting to get to success. And we have to be willing to push the envelope to try things that frankly we know are probably going to fail. But even when they fail, they teach us something really important and that ultimately leads to success. So if you're trying to navigate ambiguity, if you're trying to do things that have never been done before, the answers to the questions you're trying to answer have never been answered before. And it's very likely that the answers aren't in the heads of, for example, men or in the heads of, for example, management. You need to have the greatest diversity in your team. The only way you can navigate um, ambiguity is by diversity of perspectives. So you need the most diverse range of talent possible, and that's why collaboration is so important. When you get a broad, diverse range of perspectives in the room, one of those perspectives will be the unique perspective that gives you the insight you need to navigate the ambiguity that you're, that you're trying to manage. So I think the future of collaboration in Australia starts to look more like a network where the power is actually the number of elements in the network raised to the power of their perspectives. So the more the diverse the, more diverse the perspectives are, the more exponentially powerful the network becomes. I think that's how you navigate innovation. Ava, both, both Larry and and Sue have said that Australia does have great quality researchers. Many of those researchers sit in our universities. From your perspective, what can be done to improve and lift their contribution to the innovation system? I think a great deal has been said about collaboration, but um, as Larry said, um, CSIRO, for instance, uh, collaborates with at least two partners for every project, and one of them is a university, and I think those collaborations are key. But universities have a broader role in that. I'm thinking about our students and our graduates. You know, we have a role and responsibility in universities to ensure that we are educating the innovators of the future. You know, we, we talk a lot about employability. Um, employability is, I think, a concept that doesn't in, uh, translate itself very well to innovation necessarily. So we need to think about innovators of the future. And you know how we talk about the T-shaped graduates who are very deep in their knowledge about particular disciplines, but have the cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and skills-based um, knowledge, but also ability to do things. So the responsibility we carry in universities is with our students and also with our graduates. And you know, universities do incredible things in uh, curriculum, for instance. And we've heard today, for instance, a joint work we do in constructing curricula, which is trying to predict the future, Larry, the same sort of thing, where we're trying to think about what is it that the future workforce looks like. And um, at Murdoch, for instance, we have a, a minor that we just started on creative intelligence. It's very similar to U UTS. They have a, a, a similar minor. And this is where we're trying to bring people together from dis different disciplines to look at real world problems. So real world learning and all of that is, is very important. I'm also, universities have, a, I think, a great role in 
being what I call porous institutions. That means that our campuses are places where people can come. And as you know, um, Australia uh, uh, having people placed in universities from industry and vice versa, we are not doing as well as we could in that. And I've been thinking about what incentives could there be for that. And I'm thinking about, for instance, of funding pipelines. So we get funding, of course, for pure research, we get some translational linkage funding and so on. But do we also uh, require funding that specifically is targeting for people to go and, and work in situ in industry and business and also in uh, universities? Universities themselves as well um, have some work to do. We need to have a clear front door that people know where to go through for business and industry. And they have to be able to find that front door very easily and then get the value added through that. When I was in the UK, I worked in a university, University of Hertfordshire. And this was about 10 years ago, I was a deputy vice chancellor. And we did an incredible thing. We actually re-engineered our university entirely to be what we call business facing and industry facing. And what does that mean? So internal structures, for instance, our academic faculties became strategic business units. We wanted to, to be business-like. We had, this is 10 years ago, we had a real culture of KPIs, but we were helped by the UK government funding. UK government provides funding for three streams, students, research, and this called third stream, which is business university interaction. And the better you did in your business inter industry interaction revenue, the more you funding you got from the government. And in that funding for universities, in that revenue, we counted contract research, consultancy, uh, professional development, and then IP and commercialization. But interestingly, commercialization actually was the smallest proportion of that funding. So the general point I like to make through this is that in order for universities and business industry to be more engaged and truly add value to each other, I think we need to take quite a holistic approach. And we must not focus simply on commercialization, and we don't, of course. And another point I want to say about collaboration was that um, clusters are important and focus is important. And uh, I was thinking about university precincts. I think this is a great initiative in Australia. And we need to find a way in which we fund these precincts. At Murdoch University, we are going to launch a precinct which is a knowledge and health precinct, particularly around the One Health initiative and concept. And we are looking very carefully now how could the federal government come into that? What value do we add to the state government? How do we get other research partners and how do we get investors in there and create that sort of a porous innovation ecosystem? And it's not going to be a technology park. It's not going to be an, uh, an incubator. It's going to be an environment in which these partnerships come together. And, you know, I'll, I was very impressed by the new... Um, Chancellor of uh, UTS, um, Catherine Livingston, in her speech when she talked about innovation in her inauguration speech. And she said um, that innovation is people business. Innovation doesn't happen in governments, industries, it doesn't happen in universities, but in people in them. So somehow through our knowledge precinct, we are very keen to create an environment that attracts people, keeps them there, and we have the right funding levers to do that. So there's a few ideas around how universities, I think, have a key role in innovation uh, enterprise. Thanks. I'll, I'll ask Sue to comment on that and then open it up to, uh, to questions from the floor. So I think I'm a great believer in that you get what you incentivise and, and I take uh, the comments and, and, and certainly the vision being painted um, uh, here 
because I think that's going to be really important. When I worked in the US in pharmaceuticals, uh, it was pretty seamless that people would move from industry to academia and back again. And you weren't just measured on your citations or the patents that you were doing, but it was much more important to look at those patents that you jointly filed with industry or you internationally filed with collaborators. And I think, uh, you know, we do need to get those models right and we do need to put in place the sorts of incentives um, to actually drive that innovation. And I think we are seeing some of that with the change in the NHMRC. One of the things the growth centres do do is we review all of the grant applications in the space, so ARC, CRC, CRCP. And the reason we do that is to try and identify what everyone's doing from a landscaping perspective, but also more importantly, working out um, who we can better connect with industry or with academia to get better outcomes. And so I think this is an experiment that needs to run and I'm quite excited about what some of the universities are doing in this space, but it has to be more than just citations uh, and patents and we need a new way of thinking about how industry and uh, academia work effectively together. Thanks, Sue. Um, so we'll open it up for uh, questions to the panel. If you have a question, please raise your hand and there are microphones on either side of the room um, that will be brought to you. And please uh, say your name uh, and indicate uh, which panel member uh, or all panel members that your question is directed to. Uh, my Hi. Name's, hi. Uh, my name is Jonas Rupp. I'm the uh, EU Science Technology Innovation Advisor here in Canberra. Um, uh, the uh, comment has been made about bringing, in the last uh, comment by Sue, uh, industry and academia together. Uh, the comment's also been made in the middle of the table that the, um, the, it, the uh, funding can help, uh, global innovation strategy can help, or funding comes from, that, go that comes from government can help. Uh, the EU has a 80 billion over seven year, 80 billion euro, that's about 120 million dollars, uh, over seven year program to foster science innovation. And, and research. Um, what's, what, what are your ideas to anyone on the panel about better tapping uh, the private sector pool of capital rather than, uh, it, or what's the best investment on the government side rather than just increasing quantity? Thank you. I might use a specific example um, from my sector. So we went out to our sector and asked for big, bold ideas. We had $15.6 million to invest over a period of four years, and this was the federal money, federal government money, and the growth centres actually um, invest that uh, into the sector to address constraints and barriers. And so we called out to industry for their, their solutions, if you like, their big, bold ideas to constraints and barriers. And uh, to our $7.4 million that, that we were investing uh, last year, um, we got $90 million worth of matched funding from industry, cash, not ca not contribution, that was cash up front um, to invest in the sector. So we ended up choosing of the 39 projects that, that, that we actually had applications for, we chose 14, which deployed $32 million to our 7.4. So I think there is um, a huge willingness by industry to engage uh, in the constraints and barriers and to have a more productive and uh, commercial and competitive environment, I think you've just got to, to get the, the metrics right and I think you have to ask the ecosystem to be involved in their own success and that's the entire ecosystem including government. Any other comments on that one? Um, I think I'd just say one thing which is around metrics and getting the metrics right because um, I think one of the most fundamental um, um, elements of the UK strategy was for the metrics that were put on universities in terms of industry business engagement and how that then drove further funding and performance on those metrics. And uh, metrics are powerful for um, changing behavior and mindsets. So I think that we need to go somewhere as fundamental as that when we're trying to start thinking about how we, how we use our limited resources. I would just add, um, you know, when I was a student in the 80s, um, there was kind of an entitlement attitude in academia um, and the notion of working with industry was kind of dirty. And that has changed, um, but the notion of going to the government for funding, um, you know, the government has to help, the government has to intervene, 
I, I think that notion isn't going to help us very much um, if we stick to that to that thinking going forward. I mean, let's face it, the, the deficit is higher than it's ever been. Um, government debt is higher than it's ever been, and, and we're not in a mining boom anymore. So, so I think we need to be probably recognising that we need to be a little bit more creative about where we go um, for our funding. Um, last year, for example, um, my own organisation, like all organisations, you have um, a revenue budget and you have to live within the budget. Um, we had a significant reduction in traditional revenue sources, almost 30 million um, down. Um, but a year earlier, we'd recognised the importance of global. It's one of the pillars of our strategy. And we delivered about 30, a little bit more than 30 million of new revenue, new funding from global and industry sources. Um, as a result, um, the number of people in the organisation actually grew. Now, I know you didn't read that in the media, but blame them, not me. Um, but that's an example of recognising a market reality and shifting the organisation strategy to avoid, you know, hitting the wall. This is what startups do all the time. I can tell you it, it's hard to pivot a five and a half thousand person organisation. It's a slow ship to turn. But, but we do have to be more creative about where we go for funding. Same with the, the, the National Innovation Fund, the Saro Innovation Fund. Um, going to very non-traditional forms um, of, of, of capital who want to invest not just in economic return, but in a return to the country and a return to the nation. Um, in, in that boom that I talked about between the telecom boom and the internet boom and the, and the clean tech boom, there was a period of about five years in the valley where you couldn't raise money if you weren't outsourcing your hardware to China and your software to India. And if you had any employee base in the valley, you were kind of, no one wanted to give you money. And I'll never forget this because Don Valentine got up one day at a, at a conference and said, what are we doing? What are we doing to our country? And the traditional argument is, no, no, we, we're, our job is to deliver the maximum possible financial return. And he said, no, it's not. That's one of our jobs. Our job is to, is to support our ecosystem. And, and we're destroying our ecosystem by having a silly requirement like that. What were we thinking? And from that point forth, again, the top three VCs led by Sequoia changed that policy and not only invested for maximum financial return, but they shifted to a model more like impact investing. So how are we going to impact our ecosystem positively? How are we going to create value together? Collaboration is the key, but you can only collaborate if there's something to collaborate for. So that means we need to create new value and share that value to reward the collaboration, and that forms a virtuous cycle that will drive more collaboration. Thanks, Larry. Do we have another question from the floor? Hi, thank you. Mike just coming. Hi there, this um, question is really to everyone on the panel. Um, earlier today we heard about um, STEM graduates and employment outcomes not being great for STEM graduates. Over the course of the day we've heard how important STEM is for workforces of the future. And um, we're sitting here talking about collaboration, research, industry collaboration, and I was wondering if you could have a think about, or if you could tell, tell us what you think about how we can not just prepare our students for those STEM jobs, but actually um, show them the pathways and how, how industry and um, universities can work better to help STEM graduates find the jobs and, and be inspired for, you know, where they're going to end up. Do you mind if I change your question slightly? Sure. You can change it for yourself. <laughs> because the, because the, the problem is actually earlier, I think. The, the, the problem is in the stream, the pipeline going into university. And if you look in primary schools, the, 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 the passion for science, the interest in science is high. And something goes wrong, particularly for girls, between that passion in, in early education and, and when they finally get to university. Um, there's a number of programs that um, different organisations do to try and change that. So we have one that's very collaborative across the whole university sector called Scientists and Mathematicians in Schools. We do five or 6,000 school visits a year um, and we match make um, STEM professionals in industry and in universities and in CSIRO to teachers. Because the problem is many science teachers, people teaching chemistry or physics didn't study chemistry or physics. 
in primary school. So we match make them with someone who did, who can really help them and we give them tools and resources to help address that, that imbalance. It's so important that we do though. So, so we talk about Australia punching above its weight. According to the chief scientist data, we're twice the global average in environmental science. We're half the global average in STEM skills. Worst in physics, which is my skill, by the way. Um, so we, we've got to bring that into balance because it's the STEM skills that enable us to reinvent the future. It's the STEM skills that enable us to mitigate, for example, climate change. We need those skills if we're going to do something about it. Completely agree. Uh, you're talking to a science graduate myself, um, and I have children who are really passionate about science, and I want them to keep that passion. However, Can we get you in our program. <laughs> <laughs> however, I do look around and see a lot of science graduates um, who aren't using their trade in the way that our um, European counterparts or our US counterparts are in the... We are actually doing a lot of work in educating um, our, our kids, and that's great, and it doesn't matter where they end up, but I think industry needs to be doing more to be employing um, some of these people, um, and government needs to be doing more to build those industries and create that scale that we need for people to, you know, see a future in STEM. So I feel like I've answered my own question, but please, I really yeah, want to yeah. hear. I, I mean, I'll talk to two programs that we're running that may be of interest and, and terrific collaboration from ATSI and Oz Biotech on, on the IMNIS program. And this is where we actually, uh, at no cost to, to anyone at this stage, match an industry person with a PhD student uh, for a period of 12 months, uh, really as a mentoring program uh, that was run as a pilot initially in Victoria and in WA was very successful and in fact MTP Connect through our uh, funding initiatives are actually na now taking that uh, globe, uh, national and uh, it's taken out a, a best practices award just recently and it's a terrific program and it actually gives meaningful time on a monthly basis one on one with a very experienced industry person and that PhD student. The other one that I would speak to is that we we asked the multinationals to give back and we went out to uh, mainly the bigger pharmaceutical and, and um, uh, med tech companies and we said often health just sees you as a cost but we know you give back to that entire ecosystem uh, all the way through from investing in our research, investing in our clinical trials and then ultimately often taking our products and services and unlocking that global value. And we asked them to get together as a group. And if you've ever met too many people from Big Pharma, it's difficult for them to not compete with each other. But we got 14 pharmaceutical companies, Avcal, Medicines Australia, and three universities, pooled a whole lot of resources and um, offered that up to early and mid-career researchers uh, that may be interested to go into the pharmaceutical or biotechnology or med tech sector. And the first 100 participants of that program are just kicking off now. And that will include internships both here in Australia in pharmaceutical companies, uh, but also international internships and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that you've got kids who, who are into science. I've got a daughter who's, who's a, a STEM uh, student as well and I want her uh, on a global stage to feel good about the opportunities that she has. Perhaps I can just make a couple of comments. Um, I think uh, Larry is absolutely right. It starts at school and uh, primary school already. And uh, I was on a working group, TMAG, um, and a minister behind a while back looking at teacher education. And one of the recommendations we made was that primary teachers need to have some specializations and not just be generalists, because that is when you start to infuse young people in science and technology and maths. And uh, particularly, there's a lot of teaching also out of field. So you will have um, PE teachers particularly, and, and no disrespect, wonderful people, but teaching science as there is uh, a dearth of science teachers. In universities, um, we are very, very keen for our science and all of our, our, our students to have experience in industry and in business as part of their studies. And uh, I think that's particularly interesting and important for science uh, uh, graduates as well to have experience that is beyond their industry. So having those broader skills is important. One innovation we have at Murdoch University, which I'm very proud of, is that in our undergraduate curriculum, we are um, building a career learning spine. 
which every single undergraduate student will have an opportunity to learn skills that will then stand them in good stead when if we do believe that they're going to be seven different careers and 15 different jobs in their, in their lifetime, and some of those indeed will be outside perhaps their science field that they studied at university. Terrific. Well, um, thank you very much for a very stimulating panel. Uh, I think we learnt a lot. We learnt a lot about um, the challenges that you eloquently described, uh, weaknesses in commercialisation, uh, low risk profile in business and in academia, weaknesses in capital markets, low levels of mobility between sectors, uh, information gaps uh, across industries about future trends. Uh, and I also really uh, learnt a lot about your ideas to improve. I think, Larry, you very vividly described the role of roadmaps to ensure that Australian industries remain ahead of the curve. Sue, you talked about uh, many of your programs and the programs of your Growth Centre colleagues that are coordinating and catalyzing uh, private sector investment and, and collaboration. Um, uh, Ava, you spoke about the potential to strengthen the incentives in, uh, in education um, at all levels, um, from schools right through universities to develop skills and interests uh, in science uh, and other fields that are the building blocks of innovation. Uh, please thank me in joining our distinguished panel, Larry Marshall, Ava Lennon and Sue McClendon. <laughs>